fresh food galore. In Germany, we're used to supermarkets brimming with produce, but often it has come from far away. That makes our supply chains vulnerable. The war in Ukraine is revealing our limitations. We can tell from the empty shelves what didn't come from Germany. We need to feed more and more people globally, but intensive farming threatens the environment and our survival. If we use traditional agricultural practices, the next two billion people that will be here in the year 2050, we will need a land area the size of Brazil. It's time to switch to sustainable farming practices and new food sources. If we want to support the global food chain and offer an alternative, then we need to grow a lot of seaweed. What food will we eat in the future? Farmer Jonas Schulze-Niehoff has been refining this recipe for a long time. It's something special he thought up for his three children. This is going to be a kind of chickpea tofu. I'm going to cut it into little fish shapes for my children. Then I'm going to fry it a bit, so it gets that extra bit of flavor. It's a meal made almost entirely from chickpeas, and that comes, apart from the spices, entirely from local production. Chickpeas, or garbanzo beans, are a protein-rich pulse from the Middle East that the farmer has begun to grow in eastern Germany. He thinks agriculture and eating habits need to change. How should we eat in the future? Eating schnitzel every day isn't good, and it probably isn't good to eat just lettuce every day either. Variety, I think that's the most important thing. That means we don't have to go without anything. But it means that our food is very varied and nutritious. At his farm in the German state of Saxony-Anhalt, Jonas Schulze-Niehoff grows all kinds of superfoods. Today, he's sowing quinoa seeds. The grain is native to the South American Andes, but feels increasingly at home here. If we keep on growing what we always have, we're not going to get anywhere. Climate change means getting used to the idea of cultivating different crops. That's why I find it really interesting. And quinoa is really healthy and tasty. I'm enjoying doing this, and I think that's the most important thing. If you enjoy something, you can do it well. When Schulze Niehoff took over his father's farm eight years ago, it produced traditional crops like wheat, maize, and sugar beet. But he decided to switch to non-native crops, or forgotten ones. He's gearing up for the future with nutritious and more resilient crops better suited to new climate conditions. On the one hand, I want to try out new things, and on the other hand, I want to have long-term goals. That's important to me. My father always said farming is about thinking in generations, and I try to live by that principle. So-called superfoods like quinoa are becoming more popular due to their high nutritional value. But demand for quinoa here is driving up prices in South America and threatening their supplies. Yet this hardy pseudo-grain now thrives in Europe, too. It makes much more sense to produce things locally if it's possible. A certain degree of globalization will always remain, I'm sure. But we save an amazing amount of energy and emissions by avoiding unnecessary transportation. And of course, it would be great if we could grow our own food supplies. New drought-resistant crops could help. In Saxony-Anhalt, spring rainfall is dropping and summers are getting hotter and drier. Quinoa is a timely solution. It needs a third of the water required by wheat. Agricultural scientist Ote Grauwinkel is supporting the adventurous farmer. Together, they're checking how the first seeds of the year are developing. 
This has come up quite well. Yes, it's coming up quite well in the field, but there's a lot of weeds growing up between, and we can't see the rows of seedlings from the tractor, so we can't use machinery for hoeing yet. Mm. Crops new to the region like quinoa and practically forgotten ones like hemp mean a lot of trial and error. Things can go wrong, but diversity is key. There's risk with all crops. If the weather isn't right, then my crops might fail. From that point of view, I am reducing my risk by diversifying. It is unlikely that all my crops will fail at once. Of course, there are costs attached to the learning process. We are investing quite a lot of work in something with an uncertain, a very uncertain outcome. But it's an investment for the future. Quinoa is a superfood. It has plenty of calories and it's very healthy. And bringing it here is also an opportunity to diversify what we eat. Ote Grauwinkel wants Saxony Anhalt to become a superfood producer. The agricultural scientist has set up an organization to achieve this goal. Joost Wouter's vision for farming in the future doesn't involve cultivating the land at all. Hey, Captain Kayak! <laughs> On board with him are German marine biologist Silvia Strauss and developer Lineke Hohmann. Their workplace is, in a sense, underwater. Onto the forest? Yeah. yeah. One, two, three, four, from here from here. Down in the water, there is something that they would like to see enriching the diets of people in Europe. Seaweed. There are estimated to be hundreds of thousands of species of algae worldwide. Only a fraction has been researched. Seaweed can be cultivated on ropes at sea. Sylvia Strauss quickly identifies the types of edible seaweed. That is sugar kelp. That's sugar kelp. This green one is sea lettuce. You can eat that too. And that's wakame. It weighs at least maybe three or four kilos. That is a nice piece, Sylvia. That's for dinner tonight. In Europe, this slippery stuff is still regarded with a little suspicion. In many parts of Asia, by contrast, seaweed has long been popular. Wouters would like to see it catch on in Europe, too, and help make our diet healthier and more diverse. Now, the world mainly eats rice, wheat, corn, and meat. That promotes the rise of monocultures, makes us dependent on just a few types of food and vulnerable to crisis. If we want to support the global food chain and offer an alternative or relieve the stress on the current system, then we need to grow a lot of seaweed. Four years ago, Vauta set up the seaweed company. Before that, he worked for an unhealthier part of the food and drinks industry. He was a manager for a big soft drinks company. The birth of his son led to a rethink. Now I'm making plans to get children drinking more of those beverages, but uh, if my boy gets older, I don't want him to drink that. And then I realized that those big companies that exist, they, it's very hard for them to change. Actually, I don't think they can change. They want to. And they ride it on their social media, but in the end, it's just nothing. Currently, his company operates nine seaweed farms, cultivating the species that are native to the local ecosystems. The beauty of seaweed is that it grows in water. We don't need land. It doesn't need fertilizer. It doesn't need fresh water. Seaweed also absorbs a lot of CO2, a lot more than most things grown in soil because it develops a lot faster. So if you roughly calculate every thousand kilograms of wet seaweed, 
has absorbed 120 kilograms of CO2. To help popularize it in the European market, the team is also developing new recipes and products. The area around Magdeburg is one of Germany's corn baskets. Orte Grauwinkel wants to use its fertile soil to start a new trend. Together with her team and farmers like Jonas Schulze-Niehoff, she's introducing new arable crops to Saxony-Anhalt. She's using his farm as a test field. The problem is that most farmers experiment a bit, but because there's no scientific supervision, they don't get listened to. You're only deemed important when the university is on board, too. The researcher from the University of Halle is using her standing to back this agricultural transformation. At the moment, just under 16% of what is harvested worldwide directly ends up on our plates. 72% of it is turned into animal feed, and 11.7% is used as biofuel or as an industrial commodity. We have to move towards producing more food and away from animal feed and fuel. Above all, we need vegetables. At the moment, it's brought in from around the world. I'd like local agriculture to increase and become more crisis resilient. If we ate less meat, there would be enough food for another 4 billion people. That's another reason why Ulte Grauwinkel and her students are looking for plants that might thrive locally. Whatever flourishes here in the test garden could help guarantee food security in the future. We need new species. That's why we have this garden of tomorrow here, so farmers don't have to try things out on their fields. We're doing a bit of the legwork in advance. We can say, yes, it works, and you can try it out. Look, it's growing really well. Or, no, let's take one step back. Lentils don't really work in your soil, or chickpeas need those particular conditions. The students are recording every experiment. They're amazed at how many non-native species grow well in this part of eastern Germany. We're trying quite a lot of pretty crazy way out things here. For example, the potato bean, Malabar spinach and perennial kale. Really wild. Zukunftsspeisen, or Future Foods, is the name of the project. It promotes quinoa and chickpeas, millet, lupini beans, hemp seeds and lentils. Some were widespread here but fell out of favor. Now they're making a comeback. The idea of Zukunftsspeisen is from farm to table, to get farmers and cooks trying out new types of produce, trying out different systems, new agricultural systems, the local cultivation of new plants. But system change can only work if everyone participates. She's convinced of that. And she's got a plan. In the local youth hostel, the agricultural scientist is giving cookery courses together with her colleague, Lene Fronat. Lena, what are we doing with the quinoa? Today we're going to make a quinoa salad and a quinoa chickpea patty. At the workshops, local cooks, chefs and bakers are learning how to best prepare the new ingredients. If agricultural system change is going to work, their role is vital. It only makes sense if you can get what the farmers are growing onto people's plates. So we are showing people who work with food what to do with it, to show bakers what to do with it. That's the basic idea. To put it simply, from farm to table. The baker is trying his hand at making hummus from regional chickpeas. Too much lemon juice, it's sour. It's absolutely new for me. I'm a regular baker who uses rye, wheat flour and salt. But I've got 30 years working life ahead of me, and this is the future. My children might take over my bakery business and I want to build a foundation. It's a nice alternative. I'm looking forward to it. 
Und ich freue mich drauf. The hostel cook is also enjoying the change. It doesn't always have to be potatoes. Why not use something different for a change that can be just as easily cultivated? Something from the region which is sustainable. Quinoa salad with beetroot and apples, for instance. A local choir is getting to sample the food. All the ingredients are vegan, halal and kosher. So the cook doesn't have to offer alternatives and can put on a really good buffet without spending more. So how's it going down? My daughter cooks like this, so I'm a bit familiar with it. And I think it's good, but personally, I'm still a bit conservative. I would also make a patty from chickpeas. We know it from falafel and so on. It's good, definitely. Now we'll have to see what went down well and what didn't, and we'll need to continue supervising the cook. But Ute Grauwinkel has to tend to other things first. An inconspicuous building on the edge of Copenhagen. Could it be the solution for many of our food problems? Owner Anders Riemann certainly thinks so. The name of his newfangled farm is Nordic Harvest. My background is as a financial analyst at an investment bank. And eight years ago, I was sitting doing an incentive program for the employees of uh, the bank, which gave them the opportunity to earn 100% on top of their salary if they were high performers. So uh, then I thought, is it OK just to sit and earn some money for yourself and not do enough for the society? The banker became a farmer and set up Europe's largest indoor farm in the Danish capital. For Anders Riemann, vertical farming is a way to stop the destruction of ecosystems and feed the world's growing population. At the moment, 38% of the world's land area is used for food production. It consumes 70% of fresh water and is responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. At Riemann's eco-friendly vertical farm, crops grow without any soil at all. This is the roots growing directly in the water. The roots absorb nutrients from water more easily than from soil, so they need less fertilizer. The facility is also constantly recycling water it uses almost 95% less than conventional vegetable farming. But the biggest challenge was finding the right lighting. One day on my way home from the metro at 3 o'clock uh, at night, after going out in the uh, town, I thought, what about uh, LED light? Have they been developed enough to make photosynthesis for plants so you can grow them in layers in water? And in actual fact, 20,000 LED panels were able to function like sunlight and stimulate plant metabolism. The light looks purple because vertical farming combines different light spectrums to promote plant growth. We have LED diodes which we put into an aluminum plate and the aluminum will absorb the heat and put it out in the room. The temperature here is between 22 and 26 degrees Celsius, ideal growing conditions for salad. And the electricity supply is carbon neutral thanks to wind power. Inside, things grow a lot quicker. There are 15 harvests a year, outside only two to four. Vertical farming is independent of the seasons and climate conditions. It's more secure. Now, after Corona and the war in Ukraine, we are very vulnerable for security of supplying food. So we need to be able to have food production inside of the cities as part of the infrastructure. Shorter journeys also mean Riemann saves transport costs and avoids CO2 emissions. It's just a few meters from the shelf to the harvesting machine. Most of the work is done by machines, but the technology is still very expensive. Full-size facility for us would be about 25 million euros because 
if the technologies that have just been profitable, so when it's developed further, then it can be profitable in other countries of the world. They are not yet using the facility's entire surface, but already supply 120 supermarkets. When up to speed, the farm could produce some 1,000 tons of leafy greens, 250 times more than conventional agriculture from the same surface area. At the moment, Nordic Harvest only grows lettuce and herbs here, but more vegetables and fruits, like strawberries, are planned. Hello, Lara. Hey, Anna. How is it going? Good. Good. I came to hear about the results from... German plant scientist Lara Smigielski oversees processes in the vertical farm. And we want to keep them alive. She's working with bacteria that will support plant growth. Yeah, they do. They do. Okay. Thank you. I think that we have all the technology here at hand and we have to ensure that we also use it in a positive way for the future. We're doing good pioneering work here to make progress on that front. Population growth means that such trailblazing work is becoming more and more important for millions of people. At the Oosterstrelde barrier in the Netherlands, Joost Wouters is tending his freshly harvested seaweed. In the waterside facility, the seaweed is dried or kept fresh in water tanks for further processing. So what you see here is then the seaweed after it's finished. So this is at the end of the season. Beautiful leaves of... of um, uh, Oh, basically, you still see them here on the rope. This is nice. So you can see a full rope here, and then we, we cut it, and then we process it in our, in our products. He is already preparing new spores in glass flasks in a refrigerator, ready for seeding. Here you see the beginning of the whole life cycle. This is where the seaweed babies, in a very early stage, are growing and kept and this is where we start the base material for the seaweed. The spores will later be sprayed onto the ropes that will be dropped back into the water. But today, he and his team are trying out a few products they intend to use to stir up the food industry. Finally, some food! Wow, that looks so ah. good! Wow. Look. Tell me, what do we have here? No, so we have now seaweed sausages and seaweed burgers. I cannot wait. Barbecued meats with seaweed. These sausages aren't made from pure pork, but include 15% seaweed. This beef burger is 30% seaweed. Joost Wouters and his colleagues realize that not everyone is prepared to give up meat entirely, and seaweed helps to cut CO2. It means you can use 30% less meat. That's less meat to be produced, and of course, it's much more sustainable. Cattle farming produces lots of the climate killers, methane and CO2. On average, the production of a kilo of beef has a carbon footprint of 13.6 kilos. If you replace 30% of the beef and beef burgers with seaweed, the carbon footprint would drop to 9.5 kilograms per kilo. Marine biologist Sylvia Strauss also wants to popularize a Japanese dish in Europe. It's a kind of seaweed fondue. It turns green immediately, but and now take it out and dip it. Wait. Uh, Oh, nice! It is, it's, I love it. This is okay. fantastic. Go ahead. In restaurants, we can we can have this as a as a as a how do you say that as an experience. Yeah, so you get some fresh seaweed exactly. on one side. You put a fondue on the table. No. It is. This is really nice. Sometimes Valtas finds it hard to believe how far he and his company have come. Ten years ago, he was still a manager in the soft drinks industry, and now he's working to create healthy food fit for the future. He's moved by the thought that his vision might come true. I thought, like, if we can cultivate seaweed on a big scale and let the world know and benefit from what seaweed can bring and offer alternatives for our food chain, I think... 
then I'm happy, man. So I hope everything fits. Oh, great. So what do we have? Chickpeas, quinoa, and hemp. Organic farmer Jonas Schulze-Niehoff and agricultural scientist Ote Grauwinkel have been working on their joint mission for three years now. Today, the superfood expert is promoting their climate-friendly and drought-resistant foodstuffs at an organic market. I think it's important to get into conversation with people and ask them whether they like the food or not. What are they looking for? Do they have questions? That's why I like going to the markets. I want to listen to people and pass their feedback on to the farmers and into the field of research. More and more people are getting into chickpeas. Over the last 10 years, imports have risen fivefold. Grauwinkel would like to meet the demand domestically and gain more chickpea fans. We freshly milled the flour and baked them yesterday. I've hardly ever seen something so versatile. They're lovely, so crisp and nutty. And if you can eat chickpeas but can't eat nuts, it's a great alternative. It's my mission to create farming and a future fit for coming generations. I want to get other people on board and give them a plan B. Yes, to get them on board and tell them that there are ways of changing things. Jonas Schulz and Niehoff's chickpeas are ready for sowing. The idea of growing a new crop came to him in his kitchen. Pulses contain a lot of protein, but domestic types like garden peas don't grow so well here anymore. It's more difficult now with native legumes because the weather, the climate has changed. With the mild winter, we saw a big rise in pests. I was on the lookout for alternatives, and one thing led to the next. Now I'm growing chickpeas. The farmer's homegrown chickpeas have been on the market for five years now, and recently he's acquired a big customer in Berlin who's using them to make kofu, something akin to tofu. We need to eat less meat and more plant proteins. We need more variety than before. And then I think we will be able to feed more people using less land. That's what we have to aim for if we really want to survive as a society, as human beings. Jonas Schulze-Niehoff is already making the switch to a new type of farming. One that could ensure that there's enough food for everyone.